another facet of discovering God's will actually comes through vision. Vision is so important. We never think about vision. And if we do, we think that vision is only meant for huge organizations or huge churches or huge projects. Um, But we never think about vision really being something powerful in our lives so that we can discover God's will. And you want to discover God's will because without God's will, you can't really experience what you really want. In order for you to experience what you really want, you have to discover God's will because without God's will, you can't really experience what you really want. And then you end up going with what you think you want. I like this verse in Proverbs that says something. It says, Solomon, who was a real historical figure, writes this down and he says, where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. Where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. When you live without restraint, you do what you want, when you want, with whom you want, and you gravitate to what you think you want, And the reason why you gravitate towards what you think you want is because you have no restraint. And the reason why there is no restraint in your life is because you don't have a vision for your life. A vision is powerful. A vision can keep you from a lot of pain, a lot of wasted energy. A vision can keep you from a lot of easy wrongs in life. And this is why he's saying without vision, without you knowing what your vision for your life is, without you knowing the will of God for your life is, without you knowing a vision for your life, you're going to live without restraint. And without restraint means you do what you want when you think you want, with whom you want, however it is that you want. And one of the primary ways that God will direct you and guide you is by giving you the vision of your life. And as your vision gets clearer, the options get fewer and the decision gets easier. As your vision gets clearer, the options get fewer and the decision, it gets easier. So a lot of us go through a lot of painful moments, a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration because we don't know what to pick and choose. We don't know what's right or wrong. We don't know if we can fight the easy wrong. We don't know if we're eventually going to build up and muster some courage to actually take the hard right. And the reason why you're living this way without restraint is simply because there's no vision with your life. But as your vision for your life gets clearer, the options get fewer and the decision gets easier. A vision is actually very similar to the picture on a puzzle box. Without the picture on the puzzle box, All the pieces are worthless because you won't have a point of reference towards what you're trying to build. Every single little piece in here, even though it's correct, but because you don't have a picture of what the final outcome is supposed to look like, every piece, every relationship, every advice, every sermon, every single time you come to church becomes worthless. Why? Because you need a picture. You can ask God for a picture. And if you ask God for a picture, he is faithful to reply. He is faithful to respond. He is faithful to give you something that you need. And not only what you need, but what's going to fulfill your entire life. Shout amen. And see, here's the problem that so many of us charge out in life trying to do life without the picture. So many of us go jump out at life and we're, and we're trying to live life and we're trying to do things. But the problem is we don't have a picture. And if you don't have the picture, you don't know what you're building. So can you imagine me trying to <laughs> put all this together without knowing what it's going to look like? And this is how so many of you are doing life right now. Help me, Lord. You're trying to put all this. This is intricate. This is hard. And you won't do it. And you can't. Because you need the picture. You need the picture. This picture is your point of reference. This picture is your context, because when the vision gets clear, the options get fewer. And the decisions for your life, they become easier. But you need a vision. Without the picture, you will have little to no context in decisions that you're making. And the decisions that you're going to make are very critical, critical decisions that involve very important areas of your life. But if you have no context, if you have 
no picture. If you don't have a final outcome, if you don't know what you're building towards, if you don't know what you're putting together, you will take a lot of decisions that will bring a lot of pain. And not only pain to your life, but pain to those that come after you. So example is this. So many people say, I want to get married. Okay, describe what that marriage should look like. A lot of people go, I want to get married. And they're so obsessed. And I mean, single people, amen, this is us, right? I want to get married one day. Okay, but if you want to get married one day, can you explain to me what that marriage should look like and what it could be? Because here's the problem. Here's the problem. If you say, I want to get married, and if you just simply say, I want to get married, you don't move on from simply just saying, I want to get married one day. Chances are one day you'll just be married. And just being married doesn't really make a visionary statement. Just being married just doesn't make a visionary purpose. Just being married doesn't really mean that it's going to be an okay marriage. You got to learn. Listen, you got to learn to get a picture. You got to get a vision because without vision, people cast off restraint. You begin to settle for things that you shouldn't settle for. You begin to put your eyes on things that you shouldn't. You begin to start conversations with people that you should be far away from. You begin to place yourself in proximity to the easy wrong. I see some smiles happening. I know I'm preaching when when I see the smiles. You begin, (laughs) you begin, listen, you begin to spend time in places you shouldn't. And it's simply because you have no vision. You gotta get a vision. Without vision, people cast restraint and they settle for things. And not only do they settle for things, but they waste so much time and energy trying to put the puzzle puzzle pieces together. Uh But you can't if you don't have a point of reference. Now. Now, some of you, you're clear with this when it comes to your professional life. You, you, you've made it clear when it comes to your professional life. Some of you got it down so well professionally that if I asked you a question about your profession, you can tell me the next steps for the next five years. Because you know where you are and you know where you want to be. So if you are at a diploma level and you want to get to a PhD, you know exactly what you need to do. You know how long it's going to take. You know how long the course is going to take. It's going to take me another two years to do this course, another two years to do that course. And so literally, and then another six months to do this one, another four months for that one, and another two months for that other one that they're asking me for. So literally, you can actually tell me what the next five years of your life is going to look like at a professional level. But how about your personal level? How about your spiritual level? How about your God level? How about your family level? How about your heart level? How about your emotional level? How about your dating level? How about your relational levels? See, we're so good at getting it down professionally, but how about personally? And you've made investments, and you've tried to figure things out at a professional level, and you've researched, and you've done your part, and guess what? You have made progress. You made progress. But what about... Your personal life. Some of you, you're already halfway transit. Like you've transited halfway to your professional life. Good. But what about your personal life? Are you charging out just no direction with no picture, no vision? Because anytime you try to build a puzzle without the picture at the front of the box of the puzzle, you ain't building anything. And it's just a matter of time before that reality hits you. And this is why you hear so many people saying at an older age, they go, I wasted so much. Time. I wasted so much. Time. And I just, I'm just simply married. Oh, come on. The reason why is because you never paused. And here's the advice I want to give you. Pause. Stop. Stop and ask God, God, what is the vision that you have for my life? What is the vision that you want me to build in this life? Because I know you created me with a purpose. I know you created me with something. I know that I'm called to do something here. 
I know, I know. You gotta ask God, because the truth is, as your vision gets clearer, the options get fewer. And the decisions, they get easier. As your vision gets clearer, the options get fewer. And a decision, decisions, all those decisions, that one decision right now in your life, easy, wrong, hard, right, that one decision, it gets easier. But you need a vision, and a vision comes from the will of God. And if you really want to experience what you really want rather than what you think you want, if you really want to experience what you really want, you're going to have to ask God for his will because you can't experience what you really want until you discover the will of God for your life. And if you don't discover the will of God for your life, you're always going to be bumping in and crashing into what you think you want. And then you're going to end up with headaches. And then you're going to end up with pain. And then sometimes you might even end up with a consequence that is a permanent consequence. And you don't want to be in a permanent consequence. Because there are some things that are reversible, but there are a few things in your life that if you go for what you think you want, these things will become irreversible things. And so I want to talk to you about a story. And this story is about this guy called Nehemiah. Can you say Nehemiah? Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a cool name. So Nehemiah gets exiled and he starts serving this king, this uh, king of another nation, and he became the king's cupbearer. And so he had to try the juice out of the wine cup, the cup of wine, in case someone poisoned it. What a job, right? I wonder what your resume has to be to get that job, right? So he had to drink out of the king's cup before just to make sure that the king wasn't getting poisoned. So that was his job. And then Nehemiah gets reports that the walls of Jerusalem have been burned and that they've been broken down and that they're just completely shattered. And then the burden fell into Nehemiah's heart that he needed to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And this is where his vision was given. So he goes and asks the king, hey, my king, I heard that the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down. I have a burden for this. I want to go rebuild them. Can I go? And what's amazing is this, that when you're under the will of God, things just open quickly. The king was like, yes. Not only will I give you and grant you permission to go, I will give you a letter that says that you can travel throughout all the neighboring countries so that you could be safe. Oh, it's not going to be just done just there because you're under the will of God, Nehemiah. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you all the material that you need to build the walls. Oh my, the provision was just there. And you know what? It doesn't just finish there with the permission to go and so that you could be safe and so that you could have the material that you need. I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually give you separate material so that you can build your own house. Wow! When God provides, it's an overabundance. And nothing's better than being in the will of God because when God provides joy, it's over in abundance. When God provides my peace, it's over in abundance. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't know how I'm smiling through this thing. I don't know how I'm preaching through this thing. I don't know how I keep moving through this thing. But it's because the peace of God, yeah, when he gives it to me, it's over. And it's overflowing. And it's over in abundance. Shout amen because God is good. God is great. So he gets this permission to go and he gets this material to build the walls, but not only to build his walls, he's like, hey, you can build your own house. And he goes and he starts building and he travel. But every vision has opposition. Every vision has the easy wrong. Every vision has tough trials. Every vision has a temptation. Every vision, every vision for every single one of your lives. You will have speed bumps along the way. And that's exactly what happened. There's this guy called Sam Ballot. You know he's a loser. I'm just kidding. Sam Ballot. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sam Ballot had two friends. And these two friends were pretty large, pretty big authorities in the surrounding nation of Jerusalem. And they had a problem with Jerusalem. They had a problem with the vision. They had a problem with God's plan. Because the enemy always wants to rise up when you start working on God's plan for your life. And he'll start throwing things at you. And he'll start throwing things at you. And he'll start throwing temptations. He'll start throwing easy wrongs. He'll start throwing people. He'll start throwing haters. He'll start throwing loud voices. He'll start throwing negativity. He'll start throwing depression. He'll start throwing discouragement. He'll start throwing things because that's what the enemy does. When you start getting on route with God's plan, you gotta expect a little resistance. Don't cry about it. Fight about it. Yeah. Yeah. Get, 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 get tough. Yeah. Build some thick skin. And that's what happened. Sam Ballot with Tobiah and this other guy, they started opposing the work of the wall. 
And we read that in from chapter four all the way to I forget what chapter, but we're going to pick up the story in chapter six. And the Bible says this. Nehemiah says this. He writes in his journal, he says, Symbolic Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained. Can you say no gaps? No gaps. Though we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. No gaps. When you start closing the gaps on your easy wrong, when you start closing the gaps on that phone number that keeps texting, when you start closing the gaps on all those DMs that slide inside your DM box, when you start closing the gaps on those broken relationships that you need to get out of, when you start, listen, when you start closing the gaps on that easy wrong that wants to eat at your heart, that drink that wants to drink your soul away, that relationship that wants to bite everything off of your life, when you start closing the gaps, I'm going to tell you something. The enemy's going to start rising even higher. Don't get scared, though. God's behind it all. Expect the resistance that when you close the gaps, the enemy gets upset. Yeah. Yeah. Expect the resistance that when you begin to close the gaps, Tobiah and Sambalad and Gashem are going to start coming at you. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get freaked out. But instead, keep building your vision. Yeah. Keep closing the gaps. Yeah. Keep building that thing. Build that thing around you. In the name of Jesus, what he starts, he completes. What he begins, he sustains. He sustains. And he will see you through it. God will see me through it. He's seen me through like it before. He is Lord. He is Lord. Now catch this. Verse 2. So Sambalad and Gashem sent a message. Can you say sent a message? They were texting Nehemiah. Some of you, you really got to block that number. Some of you really got to stop opening those texts. Some of you need to stop reading those texts. You got to decline the invitation. So some Alan and Geshem sent a text message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Oh no. <laughs> you know. You know. You know. That you got to decline the invitation. When the invitation says, "Oh no." Come on now. Come on. Come on now. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know what your own no is. Let me get a little bit more descriptive. You know who your own no is. You know who and you know what your ono is. And anytime the ono, anytime the easy wrong invites you to the plane of ono, you gotta be like, oh no, hell no. Oh no, hell no. Oh no, hell no. Oh no. If it says oh no, you better know you gotta run away and let it go. If it says oh no, you gotta know and resist that you gotta let go. If it says oh no, I'm gonna decline that invitation in the name of Jesus. You know what your oh no is. Your easy wrong will invite you to the plane of oh no. Snapchat, oh no. His number on your caller ID, oh no. That party, oh no. That text, oh no. That permission to flirt. Oh no, hey, that weed, oh no, that drink, oh no, that relationship, oh no, that apathy, oh no, that anger, oh no. Oh no, you gotta know what your oh no is and let it go. You know what your oh no is? And that easy wrong, that easy wrong wants to catch you in the plane of oh no. You gotta decline. You gotta decline the invitation. And you gotta realize something. You gotta realize what Nehemiah realized when he wrote in his journal. You wanna see what he wrote in his journal? Here's what he wrote, and here's what he realized. He said, I realized that they were plotting to hurt me. They wanted to harm. You got to realize what Nehemiah realized. Yeah, yeah, that's good. 
And what he realized was that the invitation to the plane of Ono was only to harm you. It's just to harm you. Whether the consequence comes immediately or not immediately, well, if it takes a little bit of time, here's the reality that Nehemiah realized, that you got to realize, that I got to realize. That invitation, that looks so good. That invitation, that feels so right. Just listen to your heart. Shut that up. Because Jeremiah, another prophet, says, who can trust the heart? Who can know the heart? It's the most right. deceitful thing ever. That's and some right. of you, you listen to your heart all the time, and then you end up crying all the time. Uh, uh, Maybe you should pick up the pattern that if you listen to your heart, you're going to keep crying. And so you should realize that the easy wrong, the plane of all now, it just wants to harm you. It just wants to harm you. So I replied, verse 3, by sending this message to them. I'm engaged in a great work. So I can't come. I'm engaged in a great work. So I can't come. I'm engaged in a great work. So I can't come. I'm engaged. Hey, all the single people. Hey, I'm engaged to a great work. So I can't. Come, why should I stop working to come and meet with you? That is the next text message some of you need to text. I'm engaged in a great work, so why should I meet you to stop the vision that I'm working on to come and meet with you? Sorry, decline. So I replied sending this message to them. I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Wow. Wow. What a powerful response. Wow. When you have a vision for your life, you can decline the invitation to the plane of Ono from the enemy because it's only a distraction that wants to harm you to keep you from the great work that you're engaged in. I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't come. In other words, I'm engaged in a great vision, so I can't come. I'm engaged in a great vision, so I can't come. This is the power of having a vision. This is the power of knowing what God is calling you to do. Mm-hmm. Now watch the next part, okay? Four times they sent me the same message. Here's what I want you to understand. The enemy is consistent. Yes, yeah. that's true. Just because you say no once doesn't mean the invitation is going to stop popping up. You want to know why? Because the enemy is consistent and he's consistent at being patient. And he will wait and he will invite 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 and he will wait and he will invite. And And some of you aren't catching this. That he's patient and that he's consistent. And so then you get frustrated. And you go, this again? I thought I beat this. This again? I mean, am I back at square one? This again? No. It's not that you can't beat it. It's not that you're back at square one. It's not that you're not good enough, and it's not that you're not strong enough. It's just that he's good, and he's consistent, but he's patient. Yeah. And so you got to learn what to do, and this is what Nehemiah did, and we're going to learn what we need to do. Four times they sent me the same message, and watch this, and each time. Can you say each time? Each time. Can you say each time with a little bit of attitude? Each time. And each time I gave the same? Reply. Each time. Whether it was on Monday... If it happened again on Tuesday, if it happened again on Wednesday, if it came back on Friday, if it happened again on Thursday, if it happened again on Saturday, if it happened on Sunday, and if it repeated on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, well, guess what? Keep coming. Because each time, each time you step into my face, it's going to be the same reply. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm engaged in the great vision, so I can't come. I'm engaged in the great vision, so I can't come. Because if the enemy can be consistent... 
through the power and the spirit of God, I can be too. Amen. Some of you are so frustrated thinking that you can't beat it and that you haven't beat it. No. It's just that Sam Ballad, he's going to keep on inviting. As a matter of fact, after this, we, we won't get to the part of the story, but he sends another invitation after this. And he keeps on putting pressure and he keeps on adding repetition and he keeps on being patient. Because the enemy is consistent. And the power of this verse, four times they sent the same message. And each time, each time, this was four times in one day. Listen, each time the enemy comes at you, the easy run comes at you. Each time, give them the same reply. Because sometimes the invitation won't even be once a day. Sometimes the invitation will be four times, five times a day. Yeah. And each time, in the morning, each time, in the afternoon, each time, in the evening, each time, at 1 a.m. when everybody's sleeping, each time. I'm sorry. I'm engaged to a great vision. I can't come. I'm sorry. I'm engaged to a great vision. I can't come. I can't join that party because... The clearer the vision, yeah. as your vision gets clear, yeah. the options get fewer. Yeah. And the decisions, they become easier. Mm -hmm. yes. But you need this. Yeah. 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 As your vision gets clear, the options, they get fewer. And your decisions, they get easier. But you need the picture. Some of you need to ask God and go home. I ask God, what's the vision for my life? I need to go write it down. You need to pray on it. Yeah. Because there's power in vision. And this is why Nehemiah's response to any distraction was always the same. This is why his response to oh no was always, I'm engaged in a great vision, so I'm so sorry, but I can't come. When you know, when you got this, when you got this, the temptation, you can say no to the easy wrong. When you got this, you already know why you're saying, I'm engaged in a great vision. I can't come. I can't participate. I can't join you guys. I'm so sorry, I can't go to the party. I'm so sorry, I'm engaged in a great vision. I can't make it to that birthday party. I'm engaged in a great vision. I can't go out with you for drinks. I'm engaged in a great vision. I'm so sorry, but I can't date you. I'm engaged in a great vision. I'm so sorry, I can't come to that phone call. I'm engaged in a great vision. I'm so sorry, I can't come to FaceTime right now. I can't FaceTime you right now. I can't have that video chat right now. I'm so sorry, I'm engaged in a great vision. I can't make it, I'm sorry. But not sorry. No. So sorry I can't FaceTime you at night. I'm engaged in a great vision. So I can't come. This statement can save your future. As a matter of fact, I got an idea. We're gonna make iPhone backgrounds. We're gonna put that quote. We're gonna put it on a story. And some of you can screenshot that. So that when he calls, <laughs> I'm engaged <laughs> in a great vision, <laughs> so I can't come. <laughs> you having a good time? Yeah. Wasn't this just the perfect way to end the series? Give God glory. Come on, man. Put your hands together. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up very quickly. And I got a very powerful analogy that I want to give you guys. That I think that will be an eye-opening thing for all of you. There are three ways the easy wrong attacks your vision. Three ways. Three ways that the easy wrong attacks your vision. Number one is your thoughts. Your thoughts. Your thoughts, your mind, it's the control tower of your entire life. There's this verse that says this, so a person thinks in their heart and so they are. What you think is what you become. Now, I wanna give you a small little sentence that will teach you 
how that verse actually comes to pass. And here's how it is. Your thoughts become actions. Actions later become your habits. And your habits, well, they make up your character. And your character becomes your destiny. Your thoughts become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your character. And your character actually ultimately becomes your destiny. So a man thinks, so he is. What types of thoughts are you entertaining? I mean, if you're, if you're entertaining thoughts of bitterness, guess what you're going to become? A lonely, bitter person. If you entertain thoughts of unforgiveness and you keep replaying inside your thoughts the offense that happened a few years back, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to become an unforgiving person. If you keep thinking about sexual things and you are not married and you're single and all you do is feed your mind porn and sexual thoughts and ideas and fantasies of you and somebody else having sex together or you playing some fantasies of you and that person becoming intimate together, guess what's going to happen? You will end up doing things that you think you want but you don't really want because so a person thinks and so it becomes. Why? Because your thoughts become actions and the actions become habits and your habits, your habits, your habits become your character and your character ultimately becomes your destiny. The easy wrong will attack your thoughts to kill your vision, but it also attacks your, through opportunity. It attacks your vision through opportunities. And I know that this sounds a little bit crazy, but it's actually true. As you think about the picture of your future, sometimes a great opportunity will come by. But you have to realize that even if it's a good opportunity, I'm engaged in a great vision. So I can't come. Let me give you some examples of this. If you are a parent and you have children, okay? And you're taking care of your children because they're in their developing stages right now. They're young. Everything that they hear, everything that they see, they take because they're a sponge. And then you get this opportunity to get a promotion. That opportunity is a good thing. But I'm sorry. I'm engaged in a great work called my children. I can't come. This happens sometimes with us when we are in a city, we're plugged into a church, and we're growing spiritually, and we're growing well, and a relationship with Jesus, it's growing so well. Because we're in a city, and in that city, there's a particular church that we're being really grown, and we're happy because we're getting to know Jesus at a deeper level than we've ever had before. And then all of a sudden, you get an email saying, hey, a new job opening, but it's in a different city. Great opportunity, good money. It's what you've always <laughs> dreamt about. And so here's where this thing comes into play. That opportunity sometimes does, does attack your vision because in your final picture, what is most important to you is your relationship with God. That's good. That's right. And so this is where you have to be like, oh my gosh, it's a great opportunity. It's a great thing. It's a beautiful city, LA, hey. But I'm engaged to a great vision. So I can't come. Because as your vision gets clearer, the options become fewer. And the decisions, the decisions, they become easier. But without this, you will be saying yes to every opportunity you get. Without this, you will be saying yes to every good looking girl that comes your way. When you don't have this, you will be saying yes to every single guy that can sweep you off your feet just because he smells good and can talk to your ear a little bit. And this is your problem. Any guy that can talk to you, any guy that can read you a poem, you go, oh my God. But it's because you don't have this. You're missing this. And as the vision gets clearer, the options become fewer and the decision becomes easier. I need a vision from God because when I have a vision from God, any invite from the planes of, oh no, I'm sorry, I gotta resist because I'm engaged in a great vision. I can't come. <laughs> you ready for the third analogy? 
Third example, third way that the easy wrong attacks your vision. The easy wrong attacks your vision very powerfully by getting to your will. Matthias, come on. Stand beside me. Do you know how to trap a monkey? Show you how to trap a monkey. You put a coconut and you hollow it out and you put a hole. And inside the hole of the coconut, you put a banana. And he will put, this monkey will put his hand, put your hand in there. And he will hold the banana. And he thinks he's trapped, but he's not really. He's just holding on. And because he's holding on, the trap has him and he can't let go. Okay, give me the chain. Thank you. I am the easy wrong. I'm the easy wrong. And that's the thing I'm using to keep him with me in the easy wrong. It could be a person, it could be a memory, it could be an offense, it could be apathy, it could be indifference, it could be anger, whatever it is that he's holding on to, I got him because I'm the easy wrong. And so no matter where he goes, I'm always gonna pull him back. He will go, go, but I got him. And here's the image that I want you to understand, the easy wrong. I can drive him anywhere, anywhere I want. Get back, get back over there. He's my slave and I can bring him to proximity anytime I want to me. And then I can let him think that he can get away for a little bit, so go ahead. But then all of a sudden, boom, pull. Yeah. Bring him back. Yeah. And it's so simple that all he has to do, follow me, uh, all he has to do to think of this is to let that thing go. But he won't let it go because he keeps holding on to the easy <laughs> wrong. Now here's where it gets crazy, okay? This didn't start with him. This started with the previous generation. Hold on, Mike. This started with a previous generation. Both in chains, the same green ball. Yeah. Because what you don't beat, you pass on. Come on. And this is exactly how the enemy has certain people. He brings them close anytime he wants, and he does whatever he wants with them. And he takes them wherever it is that he wants to take them. God is saying, go right. The easy wrong is saying, I'm bringing you left. Uh -huh. God is saying, go left. And the easy wrong is saying, I'm gonna pull you right. Yeah. And then, and then some seasons come and they go and they can walk away just for a little bit. So go ahead, walk away. And then it's just a matter of time before these chains keep binding you. Uh -huh. Now watch this. Go back to your position. Look how degrading this is. I'm pulling them in chains. Yeah. Okay, can I get Antonio to come up? Antonio, come up. <laughs> Stay there. Look at this. I'm the easy wrong. And I have three generations in my hands. Because... The change he didn't break got, got passed on to you. And the change that you don't break will get passed on to the next generation that comes after you. Listen to the chains. Come closer. Come. This is what some of you are walking with. You're enchained. And all you have to do is let go. <laughs> Praise God. And when you let go, I hear the chains falling. Now you can clap. I hear the chains falling. To break every chain.
all you have to do is let go. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Leave it here. It's okay. Three generations in one hand. Now it seems impossible to let go, doesn't it? When you're holding on to what is holding you back, it's so strenuous. It's so hard to think about letting go because you're thinking about how big and impossible and hard the task is. Here's where the practical advice of letting go comes. Take it one decision at a time. In other words, God can't deliver what you feed. Yeah. That's right. Do you know what this looks like? That when you want to track his activity on Instagram, oh no, let go, resist. That you, when, when you want to take that drink, oh no, let go, resist. Yeah. That when you want to send that text, oh no, let go, resist. Yeah. That when you want to get and become apathetic and indifferent, oh no, let go, resist. Come on. Take it one decision at a time. And every time you choose to, oh no, let go, resist, here's what's happening. You're taking your will back. The devil is losing ground over your will. That every time you choose to resist, that every time you choose not to look, that every time you choose not to participate, I know it's hard. I know you're in your seat. I know you're urging. I know that it's frustrating. I know that you're really tempted to go look. I know that you're really tempted to go touch. I know that you're really tempted to pick up your little legs and walk to that thing. I know that you're tempted to check your phone. I know that you're tempted to send that text message. Just sit there. Just sit there. I know it's tempting to go to the party that they're inviting you to because they've been texting you all day. I know it's tempting. But it's an invitation to the plane of oh no. If you resist today, you've gained that much more control over your will because here's what the devil wants to do. The devil wants to control Shake you a little bit. Pull you a little bit. Bring you. Push you. He wants to drag you. He wants to keep you in chains. Because ultimately, the devil wants to control your will. He wants to control your will. And he uses temptation for you to give him the permission to control your will. But every time you choose to let go, he loses that much ground over your will and you're taking your will back. Amen. Take it one decision at a time. One decline 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 at a time. And each time you decline the invitation to the plane of Ono, and you say, I'm sorry, but I'm engaged in a great vision, I can't come. You're taking your will back. Amen. And the devil's losing ground Amen. over your will. God is your strength. Yes. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There are chains that need to fall off in this place tonight. 
there are things that God is leading you to, to let go tonight. This is not life. And God didn't create you to walk in bondage. He created you to walk in freedom. So the chains need to fall off tonight. Chains need to fall off. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Where there is no vision, people do what they think they want. And generations are taken. So will you make, and will you come to the conclusion tonight that you need to ask God for a vision for your life? Because as the vision, as your vision gets clearer, the options get fewer, and the decision gets easier. Thank you for watching our weekly talk at Crave Church. A new sermon will be released every week, so make sure you subscribe and turn on your post notifications. With that, you'll be notified each time we upload a new sermon. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.